before this starts, my deepest apologies for being away for so long. I, I was in a particularly time intensive part of my life, which I'm sure will not come as a surprise. I look not a day over 60 with the eyes of a cornered ferret. However, I am free now, so expect me to be actually doing stuff. The month, March. The year, 2006. The president, technically George W. Bush, but spiritually Dick Cheney. The first post has been created on Twitter founded by employees and founders of the now defunct podcasting site Odeo. I don't know what that is. Without knowing it, they created what would become one of the most influential social media sites and a staple of modern society for the coming decades. What a bunch of nerds. There's plenty of reasons to talk about Elon Musk's acquisition of Twitter. Most of them relate to ethics, as many people think that a somewhat useful side of news should not be solely in the hands of someone as petty or childish as Musk himself. Qualms that are best left for someone else. As I just think it's very funny when someone who's supposed to be good at business and keeps telling me he's good at business buys something and then runs it into the ground. You can see this from the very start, where Musk essentially bought the company for about $44 billion an interesting choice, mostly because it wasn't worth that much. For most of Twitter's life, ownership has remained fairly simple up until March of 2023 when Elon Musk became the largest individual shareholder of the company which resulted in being invited to the board of directors, something he agreed to and then five days later changed his mind. What a kooky little character. Four days later from that, Elon Musk officially offers to buy Twitter at a rate of $54.20 per share, valuing the entire company at about $44 billion. That's where the number comes from. Now, this was, in hindsight, too much. And foresight, also too much. But whatever, it's only several billion dollars. Who cares? I mean, sure, the margin of error is like... 2,000%, but... What does that even mean? Like, really? What does that mean? What, are you gonna explain it to me, you little numbers nerd? You little dork? Sorry. Now, the important thing here is $44 billion, because that is a lot. And as rich as Musk is, and he is, he's not gonna supply all that money by himself. About a quarter of the money is actually his. He committed to selling off Tesla stock. Uh, some of it came from investment firms and at least 10 billion came from bank loans. This means committing to a large amount of debt with the assumption that the business will start making more money to pay off the loans and eventually start earning a profit. This brings me to chapter two. Goddamn right we're doing chapters. Uh, it's, it's, uh, these guys, every single company in Silicon Valley. Money is an abstract concept, not to us, you know, the pause. Uh, we use it as a medium for bartering. You know, we pay money and we get food in return, but it's something entirely different for venture capitalists, or as you probably know them, those empty husks wrapped in Patagonia fleece vests. You and I use money for conceptually simple things like purchasing. Instead of trading potatoes for kegs of ale, we assign everything of value and represent that with small physical objects so that we don't carry around a bunch of potatoes that we're constantly trying to get rid of. Which is actually the origin of the term hot potato, which I found out when I just made that up. Silicon Valley should really be called the uncanny silicon, the uncanny, because of the uncanny ability it has to turn billions of dollars in investment into dust faster than shredding it. That joke sucked. And he's leaving it in the video. Now, this rule applies just as much to legitimate businesses as it does to complete scams. Theranos was a startup that was pitching a machine that could accurately run hundreds of tests on a single drop of blood. Now, it was never going to make money seeing as it's hard to capitalize on a product that can't even exist. Any professional will readily admit that blood tests, as with all forms of science, are prone to error, and vocally pointed out that even if Theranos could complete its machine, it would be staggeringly less accurate, yet during its brief spot in the limelight, it managed to combust at least $600 million. The only good news was that $120 million of those dollars came from Rupert Murdoch, the source of both Fox News and shame from being born here. Murdoch, mer like and subscribe and buy my merchandise because that's how I get paid. I'm shilling. Theranos was a complete scam, but what's weird is how many companies have reported the exact same amount of profits, that being zero. Uber, Lyft, and Spotify don't really make money, and as far as I can tell, uh, literally 
never have. The only difference is these companies have the potential of earning years down the line once they've taken every competitor into a back alley and killed them. Uh, they just haven't, because the entire system is bloated, complacent, and sucks. This brings us back to Twitter, or as it's now known, I'm still not calling it X. Paying back the massive amount of debt attained from this purchase with the revenue of Twitter is theoretically possible. It's just numbers. You get the good one bigger than the bad one. That's just... That's what... That's all physics is. It's just numbers. Twitter does earn a lot of money. In 2022, they reportedly earn about $4.4 billion with 90% of that coming from advertising. The operation cost of Twitter that same year was $4.6 billion. But you may have noticed the bad number is bigger than the good number by about billion dollars. It's hard I'm taking this off. Twitter has had profitable years, but overall they're in the red, with ad revenue always being the largest earner. A large percentage of advertisers have fled the platform and don't seem to be coming back. Where did that information come from? Why would I say that? This is for a variety of reasons stemming from Musk's takeover, none of which are moral, don't worry, but like Every adult that had an Xbox gamer tag they made when they were a teenager has found out investing in something slathered with X usually doesn't have a bright future. One of the most noticeable factors was the immediate effect Musk brought to the company, that being the enjoyment, patience, and stability of a bad acid trip. The short-term success of a corporate merger and takeovers can usually be traced back to a delicate and a deliberate transition period. Twitter's takeover was more like the crossfade from the sweet velvet sounds of Sade to 100 Gex and then you're like attacked by a stranger with powers. That stranger? Albert Einstein. Did he make a joke? That was, that's, a, that's like a 20 year old joke. I'm so old, you have no idea. Some important context for Elon's actions after his takeover. Um, he didn't want to buy the company after he found out how much the site actually struggles with bots, as well as several other statistics that he definitely should have looked up. But like, who knows why he didn't? You know, why did he not do his due, due diligence? Maybe he just got tired and sulked himself into a nap. Regardless, he had already committed to the purchase before actually researching the business because despite spending the majority of his life desperately trying to be funny, he is far funnier when he's being completely serious. One of the first major changes he implemented apart from firing about half the people that worked there I hope they weren't doing anything important, was removing the previous checkmark system and instead making making people pay monthly to receive it. The only thing the checkmark even did was prove authenticity. If the New York Times account had a checkmark, then it meant that that was actually like the New York Times. So to recap, the first thing he did was encourage impersonation. It did not go well. I don't doubt he's intelligent in some regard. That's not a compliment. I've said the exact same thing about dogs, but it seems that none of those skills have transferred to Twitter. He bought the company at a much higher price than he should have because he overcommitted for a joke without doing any research. He said he didn't care about the money and he just wanted to make the site an online town square, made impersonation trivial, pushing people away from the site, making it less of a town square, making it more of an echo chamber, and also making it less profitable in a single fell swoop. It's like someone claiming to be a superhero and then min-maxing their fights with villains to create as much public property damage as possible while also not catching the villain. What are you doing? If you're wondering if the new Twitter Blue actually saw impersonation or if that is just an abstract potential risk, it's not. It happened borderline immediately. Okay, firing half of his employees. This happened much like a life-crushing addiction to silly straws. In stages, and with each one dumber than the last. On October 27th, Musk officially bought the site. By the 4th of November, half the staff was laid off, many of them finding out by being logged out of Slack, which is just Discord for work people, um, while they were using it which is equal parts unbelievably stupid and incredibly funny. Laying off staff after a takeover is very common. In fact, in many ways, that's the purpose of takeovers. It's just that usually that business is following a downward trend that they want to turn around, while Twitter wasn't exactly a failing business. It was failing in one important aspect. Love. What I'm saying is Elon hated Twitter and 
uh, it's assumed that the majority of the reason these cuts even happened was a short-term cost-saving measure because of the important burden, the same burden we all carry, the mental weight of failing to reach expectations, and 44 billion dollars of debt. Instead, this rapid culling created the idea that the person running Twitter was extremely reactive and not exactly a pillar of support. And for a company that lives on brand identity, that's probably fine. Yeah, it's, it's probably pretty chill. There's also the fact that doing this broke the law because in some instances, not enough notice was given for termination, but like whatever, if, right? It's federal laws are made to be broken. That's what I always say. Now, none of that is even like the weirdest part. Like, whatever, right? Savage cuts to stuff. America. Two weeks later, Elon issued what amounts to an ultimatum with the remaining staff saying that they can either commit to quote, hardcore work to build his vision for the site, or they could be fined. Don't know why I said amounts to, I guess it could just be considered a threat. He proposed this to the engineers, by the way, who regularly don't sleep because they're software engineers. Their work is already so hardcore, it's basically made of stone. So when he says hardcore, he means not leaving the office and doing insane amounts of redundant work. Several hundred people left, by the way. I don't know why I waited this long to say it. People were not happy. Now, this doesn't include the people that just left because they don't want to work there anymore because it's cringe and lame. Basically, the only people who still work there are people that need their visas or like shackled to the wall. So about 30% of any tech company. What struck me as strange is why he didn't give the ultimatum first, wait for people to leave and then cut what percent remained to reach 50% of the original staff. Like, the only reason I can think of is if you can't imagine people not accepting hardcore work and refusing to sleep, or you just forgot how to be a real boy. Like, damn, why aren't they accepting my onerous extra conditions? It's like this isn't part of the deal when they took the job. God, if only I knew something they wanted to bargain with. Oh, of course. Casual Fridays. Also, if you're not convinced how big of a hit Twitter's reputation took in the eyes of advertisers, a decent amount of executives were also fired, including the CEO. That's a lot of higher ups. Whoopsies, half the staff, many of whom are now suing him while he's refusing to pay severance for the executives. Pure stability, dude. Bad news, brand appeal sucks. Good news, it does not matter anymore because as you probably know, Musk changed the platform's name to X. But like, not really. Twitter has become X in name only, and even then not unilaterally. He changed the name far too quickly and without preparation. I'm still referring to it as Twitter, as does the web page that says X, or at least it did when I wrote this script, including the contact page, which still has the Twitter branding plus all over it. So they lost the brand recognition of Twitter, which they had built up over the course of about two decades, while gaining absolutely nothing because the actual name hasn't changed and some users still call it Twitter, including me, because the new name is dumb. Also, I need to take a sidebar. In researching this, I want everyone to just know how much Elon loves the letter X. It's to the point where uh, now SBS is running articles entirely about it. SBS is like NPR, but it's like an Australian thing. Don't worry, it's not relevant. He co-founded an online bank in 1999 called X, which was eventually mangled into PayPal. He founded SpaceX. He toyed with creating a holding corporation for Tesla and SpaceX called X. His son is named X whatever. He just founded an AI company called XAI. That's literally, it's everywhere. The letter is in his brain. Here he is looking like an idiot standing in front of an X while making an X with his arms. That photo you may have seen floating around of him uh, balding is him holding a card with an X on it. Seriously, he loves this letter. I would say more than his own children, except that bar is so low it's subterranean. This is scratching the iceberg, by the way. The more granular you get about anything I've mentioned, it just gets worse and funnier. Like when a bunch of employees were laid off, one of them resorted to using Twitter to find out whether they were fired, to which Musk made a retort so catastrophic that he had to rescind it because the former employee had a disability which would have opened himself up to being sued. One thing I haven't mentioned yet is the change in content moderation policy as previous to Musk's ownership, they actually had one. Banned accounts are now roaming free, uh, but less of like a free range chicken kind of thing and more like a plague. 
uh, misinformation and hate speech is running rampant with one exception. Elon Jet. Elon Jet is an automated account that posts anytime Elon Musk uses his private jet, including emissions, fuel, cost, departure, destination. You get the idea. It's just like an account that it's a soft protest. It points out the hypocrisy of trying to make everyone pay for expensive cars that are electric under the guise of saving the planet when you are actively making it worse in such large quantities. A single flight produces more CO2 than I could in my entire life if I was actively trying to. It doesn't do anything. It's inconsequential by itself in most aspects, but it's useful for public knowledge and it's a neat little introduction to the topic if you don't know anything about it. Elon Musk hates this account. Like, it takes up a non-insubstantial amount of his day thinking about this account and he was gonna crush it. And one of the first few things he did after buying Twitter was get it suspended, seemingly before he figured out the justification, but very much after he said he wasn't going to suspend the account. This is because, as Musk claims, a man climbed onto the hood of his car and endangered his two-year-old son. Now, the safety of your family is a very good reason to want the account gone. It's one I empathize with a lot. However, according to law enforcement, there is no evidence that the stalker even used the account and struggled to find any information that was on the account that wasn't anywhere else. Following this, the nine journalists that covered the story were also suspended because, as Musk puts it, they were covering real-time location data, which is, quote, basically assassination coordinates, which makes sense if he viciously guards the knowledge of where he currently is, which he does not do at all. Many of the revoked bans, though, have stuck. Uh, content moderation has also pulled back, uh, and the first round of Twitter's user monetization hit, with some of the handpicked people being deeply unpleasant with concerning ties to even more concerning movements. I don't think these people were picked because Musk believes in their policies or rhetoric. I think he's a soulless goon who doesn't believe in anything. The most likely reason is Elon favors people because it's the last few people that actually pretend to like him. Musk has dabbled with removing the block feature for at least some accounts because he found out how unpopular he is on the website he paid $44 billion for. This makes the people that still treat him as someone worth respecting and all the more valuable to him. Elon Musk desperately wants people to like him. He's clawing for it. And these people give him the time of day, so occasionally he just bends to their will. As long as Elon has any serious amount of power in the company and continues to have no friends, uh, the site isn't going to crack down on hate speech and the site is going to get even less appealing to advertisers. What a surprise, it's like he's bad at this. But that's all from me, at least for now. I keep delaying this video because more information came to light and I was uh, in the midst of something personal. Oh, it's time consuming. I uh, should be fine now, I should be free and set to just start working. Um, I have to I have to wrap this up because my, my camera keeps overheating. Um, so thanks for watching. Thanks to the fellas for supporting me. I'll see you next time.